Witte's extended parallel process model is an important theory, particularly for crisis communication, because it not only helps to explain and predict the influence of threats, but also focuses on the role of strategic messaging in the process. Let's have a look at EPPM. Welcome back to our continuing tour of persuasion theories. Pardon the uh, hacking, choking, and general snotty sound I have going on. I have a bit of a cold this week. So as we get started with the extended parallel process model, you know, one of the things I think that's interesting to note is that we see fear a lot. During a lot of political elections, we're supposed to believe that our candidate doesn't win, everything ends. During a lot of public service announcements, we're told of the evils of texting, for example, while driving, and especially while being shown a crunched up car, yet often we still do it. So we have to better understand how fear can both motivate and make us duck for cover. The extended parallel process model is a really good effort at trying to understand that. So as we get going, let's first take a look <clears throat> at the fact that we're really ruled by emotion as human beings. The pathos that we talked about when we talked about the old dead Greek guys. Emotion. You know, even the stock market, something that should in theory be based in rational decision making about the value of a company and how a company is performing, the reality is that it's based on feelings. That's why if the president gives a speech that the stock market fears is going to negatively affect it, it plummets. Or if he gives a speech while <clears throat> while and they think that it's going to benefit them, it goes up. This is why our gas prices change at anything happening in the Middle East. Even though we get most of our petroleum from Canada, Nigeria, and Venezuela combined. Ironically, not Middle Eastern countries. Why? Because this is, even our stock market, including our gas prices, are all based in speculation. Based in what people think are going to happen, our perceptions, our attitudes, and our beliefs. So it's important to understand that we are primarily motivated by our emotions. It's not our only motivation, but it's so powerful, sometimes it uh, outrules our rationality. So think of it this way. Think of it in terms of fight or flight. That motivation by fear is at its heart instinctual. That if we see some kind of, of situation or if we are exposed to something that causes us fear, there are actual physical manifestations of that. More so than any other emotion, fear is a biological response. So on the noticeable side, things like our pupils dilate, our mouth goes dry. If you ever have done public speaking in it and it's something that you are afraid of, you'll, you feel like you have a giant cotton ball in your mouth. You get tense. Some, some people sweat. Um, I've seen people who are nervous blotch up with redness. You know, even if nothing else is wrong, they, they look all blotchy. So the reality is that there is a biophysical response to that, but we also have hidden effects. These can both help us and hurt us. We have adrenaline, we, our blood pressure increases, where everything moves us towards that fight or flight response. It's action, it's swift, it's secure. That's why fear can be such a powerful motivator, that if we can invoke fear and produce a controllable fight-or-flight response with a message, we have something that can really enable our persuasive efforts. But we also have to understand that fear is not inherently a good motivator. There is actually a curvilinear relationship between fear and behavior. So think about it this way. There is an optimum point. If you look at the, the U here, at the very top it says optimum. So the demands of, of the situation that cause us fear and our ability to respond. So as the demand increases, we have this surge in our ability. This is the, this is the adrenaline. We're stimulated. 
And notice how when, as it goes up, we get to a crescendo. And then all of a sudden, it becomes a problem. Instead of being a positive motivator, you see the reduced alertness, overload, irritability, anxiousness. This helps to explain how fear can both motivate us and also keep us stuck in the same place, paralyzed by our dread. We get too much, it's an overload, and we just can't do it. It's like our computer when we open 8,000 things at once and it freezes up on us. That's really the curvilinear relationship that fear has on human beings. So when we think about the use of fear in messages, one of the predominant theorists who wrote about this is Kim Whitty. Um, she was interested and and is still doing a ton of work in, in the use of fear with the extended parallel process model. She's interested in the use of fear as a motivator, primarily in health messages. But at the point that she came into this in the early 1990s, the real question was how? None of the persuasive theories to this point had given us a good indication as to how fear can motivate and how to avoid those negative components where we're paralyzed by it. So we wanted to be able to predict the role that communication and persuasion had in that curvilinear relationship between fear and action. Based on this, based on reading a lot of work in social psychology, in, in neurobiology, she came up with a theory that explained it. So let's take a look at the components of her theory using fear and persuasive campaigns based on, on the messages themselves. So let's start with the message. The message has to create fear. Bad things will happen if you don't do what the message tells you to or not to do. You won't like me when I'm angry. So that's why it's important to start with the message. There has to be something to induce fear in the environment. Since we're talking about persuasion and communication, we begin with the message as our stimulus. If you think more broadly, this could apply to any kind of a stimulus, a rattle, happening to see a rattlesnake. The rattlesnake is not communication. So it's the stimulus. So for the purposes of communication, we begin with the message itself. Based on the message then, we evaluate how threatening it actually is. So once we receive the scary message, we actually have to figure out whether or not we're, we should be afraid. Obviously we don't go through this in, in typically a linear and and reason fashion that's the point of fear but there are two components to determining whether or not we're actually going to feel afraid by some kind of message we appraise the threat using first perceived susceptibility so I may be pretty confident that if I'm walking across a tightrope I'm gonna fall off but if nothing bad is going to happen then that fear is irrelevant we may be exposed to something that that creates susceptibility, but if it doesn't matter, we don't worry about it. So let me give you an example. The show Fear Factor, I think, is a bit silly because no one who went on the show was was reasonably afraid of this situation, or at least most people weren't. You know, there are some things that were gross, the eatings the eating things and being put in a coffin full of snakes, but it's not like they put you in a coffin full of cobras. It was getting over the ew factor rather than the f genuine perceived threat. Now, of course, there are going to be people who, who can't handle even that, but if our perceived susceptibility is that, hey, we're going to go jump off a cliff except that we're, we are fully harnessed up and the actual risk of us falling to our death is infinitesimally small, eh, we may not really react. On the other hand, if we're walking the tightrope across a uh, pool of, of hungry crocodiles, that may inspire us. So the first component of, of the appraisal of threat is determining whether or not we actually feel a threat to it. The second component, then, is how severe that threat's going to be. So we can recognize that it could affect us, but the question then becomes how much. So we go out and about during cold and flu season. 
ironic as the case may be, we know that when we're out and about and exposed to the 8,000 germs that we could get sick. So even if I think that I am pretty susceptible, you know, of if we've been working a lot, if we've been maybe sleeping a little too little, maybe we've been going out too much, whatever the case may be, we may realize that our immune system could be kind of compromised and we could catch a cold. But if it's just a cold, if it's an inconvenience, we may not worry too much about it. On the other hand, if we think that we're going to die, hand washing for life, we have, we have a bit more se severity. <clears throat> so how much fear is induced matters. So are we susceptible? Is this actually something that could hurt us? And how much is, is our appraisal of the threat? Once we figure out and we make this judgment about whether we're susceptible and if something happens, how bad it is, we really get the, we really, that predicts how much we're going to react. Think about, think about teenagers um, and the, the notion that, that they're daredevils, that they feel no fear because they think nothing can hurt them. Take going skiing. Look at the double black diamond. Now, at, at our age, i.e. my age, when you're approaching middle age and, and your knees say, oh dear God, when I look down the hill at the black diamond, I say, you know, no, 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 no. I think I'm going to head for the nice little, at worst, at most, um, intermediate hill, the little, the joyful little blue square. Even better yet, maybe something easy. Was that the same decision I made when I was, was 8 to 18? God, no. I was hauling butt down, down the black diamonds. You know, if it didn't hurt, it wasn't fun. That's a difference in the appraisal of threat. So once we appraise the threat, then we figure out whether or not we can do anything about it. Now, we've already talked about self-efficacy. Once we experience a threat, we have to decide whether we can act. So remember that self-efficacy is broken down into the two components, the self the overall efficacy is broken down into two components. The self-efficacy, I think I can, I think I can, our cute little train who could, you think you can make it up the hill. And that has such a strong, that, that's such a strong predictor of whether or not you even try. Yet at the same time, as we recall, we also talked about response efficacy. That it's not just that we think we can quit, but that it's going to have an impact. So let's say that you're the 39-year-old who already has throat cancer. It may be that you, you decide, look, I am already being negatively affected by smoking. Even if it means I have to smoke out the little hole in my uh, throat, c'est la vie. Nothing's going to matter. So even if we think we could, if we think that the response is going to have no impact, then we're probably not going to act too much. And so this brings us to the question of what are the possible message outcomes? If you're exposed to a fear-based message, what might happen? The first response is that there's no response. This means that the message just didn't work. We didn't feel a threat. We're not that worried about it, either one way or the other. It's not that our efficacy is low, we just didn't see a threat. There's no boogeyman in the corner. The second response is fear control. Here we get that the threat applies. We really get that the threat applies. So the threat at this point is either too great and our efficacy not high enough. So we just go into a proverbial la 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 land. Hear no evil, see no evil. We didn't see it. We don't acknowledge it because emotionally we can't cope with so much threat. You know, how do people how do people live day to day when their lives are at risk? At some point there is fear control. You just say I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to do my job and hope for the best. Those are really fear control kinds of messages because if you spend your day dwelling on it, then that's a problem.
yet take out of the context of high-risk occupations and put in other contexts that means that we we end up choosing not to quit smoking when we still have a shot all kinds of things um, and so then the third possible outcome is danger control we act we go buffy on fears but and more directly we follow the directions given in the fear message that's an important component of any fear message is that there's going to be an instruction for overcoming the fear so the danger control is all about tackling it head-on dealing with it and engaging in the behavior that's recommended to us so let's take a look at the model all together and then walk, we'll walk through a real example of it. So over on the left side, the three components that we talked about, the message or the stimulus itself, our efficacy, and the threat. <clears throat> Those three add together into our perception of our efficacy, our judgments, if you will, and our judgments of the threat. And again, notice that if there is no threat, there is no response. We just don't bother with it because we don't think it applies to us. Now, if, if our goal is to produce fear, to produce a message that motivates someone, what we really want is for that perceived efficacy and perceived threat to produce some fear. We want some anxiety. Anxiety is useful. That's why that bidirectional arrow is there. But what we really want is for someone to act. <coughs> so based on their fear appraisal, they're either going to think that they have enough efficacy to do something about it. That's why it goes back into the perceived efficacy and threat box and then routes up to the danger control process. Danger control process is our Buffy process. That's where we want to protect ourselves, and we're going to make ad adaptive changes. We're going to quit smoking. We're going to eat better. We're going to avoid a particular part of town. Whatever the threat it is that we're trying to minimize, we're going to do it. The other side, though, is our hear no evil, see no evil, the fear control process. So if we have too much fear, we, we have to defend ourselves against it the fight or the flight. This is the flight. You know, the danger control process is our fight. This is where we just pretend that, that we don't see it sometimes. We make maladaptive changes. For example, a lot of people in abusive relationships will make maladaptive changes. They will try, to, they'll modify their behavior. They'll modify how they interact with people. They will try and shape their entire life around their abuser. Because they genuinely see no way out of it. They have fear, but they see no way to get out of the situation. So they end up trying to make the best of the worst situation. In terms of behavioral change, you don't want fatalism. Fatalism is the fear control process. You want people to believe that they can act in the danger control. So let's take a, take a look from health communication with heart disease. So we talked about the low threat. <coughs> so let's say that we're exposed to a message that 20 minutes of cardiovascular exercise four times a week will reduce the risk of heart disease. Well, if we have no threat then we think that eh, heart disease doesn't run in our family. People with heart disease can live perfectly normal lives. So our efficacy is actually irrelevant. There's no threat perceived and no response. The message was not effective on us. So this actually is based on a study of exercising a campaign from the, the early to mid 90s. So let's take a look at, at a second message that 20 minutes of cardiovascular exercise four times a week is re will lead to the reduced risk of heart disease so that's the same message but here we have a high level of threat we feel like heart disease runs in our family it can be fatal maybe we lost someone as a result of heart disease 
But because of the baggage we bring to the perceived threat, where it's very high, we may have low efficacy. And if the message itself, notice this message doesn't address efficacy at all. It doesn't build up the person to believe that they think they can, nor that they're, that simply exercising is going to be enough. So if they don't already believe they can do it, this message doesn't help them. This means that it's probably going to produce a lot of fear. We're already afraid because we know that heart disease impacts us and yet we don't think we can do it. So we're likely to go through the fear control response with a defense motivation and maladaptive changes like denial, avoidance. We don't like anyone to talk about it. We don't go see the doctor regularly. We don't do, we don't measure our, our blood pressure. There's all kinds of maladaptive changes that we can make if we're in denial that we can act. So the message component with an extended parallel process model has to be able to identify what the th threats and what the issues of efficacy would be in the, in the population, our target audience, and you have to create a message that appropriately addresses those conditions. That's the important component of, of the extended parallel process model. Now, if we go to take a look at the other side, high threat, high efficacy, you know, if we have this same message, 20 minutes of cardiovascular exercise four times a week reduces heart disease, if we have someone with a perceived high threat, but also the efficacy that exercise prevents heart disease and I can do it, we get fear, but we also get the Buffy effect, that, that fear control, the, the danger control process. So we go Buffy, we go work out. Now this is where our message creation matters. You know, this the, the uh, research using this wanted a genuinely neutral kind of message because they really were most interested in the relationship between perceived threat and perceived efficacy. So one of the things that we learn from this and a series of experiments much like it is how to adapt our message, how to understand our audience and what components from our audience actually make a difference. When you're putting together your campaigns, if you use an EPPM model, you have to figure out what's going to make the most sense for your particular target audience. Now one thing as we wrap up, a point that I want to make is that we don't, we shouldn't think about campaigns as static um, or unengaging print or television ads. There are a lot of variations on the theme and the more creative and tailored to your audience, the more effective. Thinking outside the box really matters. So one of the movements in the video games industry, you know, think about it with the Wii, with health, um, and then there's also the uh, group called HopeLab.org that's using video games as a way to engage teens and young adults. In this particular game, Remission, um, they have targeted teens and young adults who have cancer. And using, using the engagement in, in a narrative, the storyline as you go through the game, it's built to create fear. You know, if you think about most first-person shooter games, if you are familiar with them, if you have kids who play with them, it's all about creating the tension in the moment. You, you can achieve things, you can move through levels, but there's always something there. Yet with more skill and more ability, you can overcome them. Thinking about video games in this way, this makes complete sense as a method of delivery for a campaign that's going to target teens and young adults. So this campaign was developed to improve cancer knowledge, improve adherence to treatment, improve adherence to aftercare, and also just to improve the quality of life for the ill. You know, think about folks who have cancer, being physical and going outside and doing all kinds of crazy things are not really, that's not really often an option. So this is meant to be fun and educational at the same time. The results of the research related to this found that because of the narrative involved, because of the presentation of risk, but with, with uh, skill rehearsal, with all those types of things that would create improved efficacy, the outcomes were really positive. 
It did improve the cancer knowledge, but most importantly, and for teens and young adults, this is the, the real critical part, the adherence to treatment and aftercare was substantially improved. So I bring this up not just as a demonstration of, of the extended parallel process model, but also to talk about the delivery of our campaigns and how important it is to find a campaign delivery a channel or a method of interacting that really speaks to your target audience. As innovative as we can be, we're going to be much more successful. So keep these kinds of things in mind as well. And with that, we will pause.